Good afternoon and welcome to week 13. And I'm not even going to lie to you, this is going to be a long video, so uh, make some time or be prepared to break this up into chunks. We have four different topics to talk about. World War I, the Russian Revolution, what happens in between World War I and World War II, and then World War II itself. So a lot of things in here. Uh, this is one of my favorite lectures of the entire semester. So I hope you enjoy it and I hope you appreciate it. Uh, we're going to start first with World War One. World War One is also known as the Great War. And we really have to talk about what's going on in Europe in the early 1900s up to 1914. Uh, Germany, uh, after the Franco-Prussian War, uh, Otto von Bismarck, who was the architect of a united Germany, he's convinced that building up the German military is too dangerous. So he tried to build up this alliance system that would isolate France. And by isolating France, Otto von Bismarck thought that he could prevent war. Now, he maintained friendly relations with Austria-Hungary. He had a formal understanding with Russia but he accounted on the dislike between France and Britain and the dislike between Britain and Russia to keep Britain out of the way. He had all this alliance politics, I guess to say, planned out in his head. Now, Britain at first tried to be friendly with Germany. Uh, Britain felt that it had overextended itself as a result of the Boer War in South Africa, but the German leader, the Kaiser, um, did not want to be very close friends with Britain. So when Kaiser Wilhelm kind of pushes Britain away, Britain is going to begin to see Germany as a threat. Now, in 1898, Germany decides to build a navy that's larger than anybody else's, including Britain's. And this really made Britain worried, and Britain began to prepare for an eventual war with Germany. Now, Germany is not just building cruisers for defense. They're building full-blown battleships that can attack anywhere. Uh, on top of that, Germany had the most powerful army on the continent, but then you add in a very powerful navy, that would allow Germany to transport its army wherever it wanted to go. And Britain suddenly says, you know what, maybe we're sitting ducks. Now German naval supremacy also threatened British livelihood because of the raw materials and the finished goods that were critical to Britain and its industrial revolution. Now British diplomacy uh, with Japan uh, Britain broke its traditional diplomatic isolation to sign an alliance with Japan in 1902. And Japan was going to take over control and patrolling the Pacific Ocean, which then freed Britain up to concentrate its navy back in Europe. In 1904, Britain shockingly and surprisingly signs the Entente Cordiale, which buried the hatchet between Britain and France. And suddenly, after hundreds and hundreds of years of being enemies, Britain and France are going to be good friends. And then, in 1907, Britain even signs an alliance with Russia, which temporarily at least settled these issues uh, between the two of them. So this left Germany almost completely alone. Germany scared of being encircled and surrounded. Uh, they've got Britain and France on one side, Russia on the other. So Germany did the only thing it could do and that was to strengthen its ties to the one friend it had left, which was Austria-Hungary. Now ultimately this is gonna prove disastrous because Serbia down in the Balkans, which was allied with Russia, and surrounded by Austria-Hungary is going to be the scene of a murder. So we have all these 
alliances. We've got the different European countries forming friendships with each other, and it gets really confusing. Um, on one side of the alliances, you have the Triple Entente. Uh, that's the relationship of Britain, France, and Tsarist Russia, or the Western Alliance. The Triple Alliance is going to end up being Germany, Austria, Hungary, Italy, and then Italy will eventually be replaced with the Ottoman Empire, or what is today Turkey. So these are your two main groups right here, the Triple Entente on one side and the Triple Alliance on the other. In reality, this is more what the, the treaties look like. Everybody somewhere is associated with somebody else and it's all held together with duct tape, chewing gum, and a prayer. See, Italy, Austria, Hungary, Germany, they all had a partnership. The Ottoman Empire had a partnership with Germany and Bulgaria. Austria-Hungary had a partnership with Bulgaria and the Triple Alliance. And you see there in the center, Bulgaria and Serbia are going to be the key to this entire thing. So what's going on? Well, in 1908, Austria-Hungary annexed a place called Bosnia and Herzegovina, and those were two areas that were traditionally part of Turkey. Uh, there was a war that happened in 1908. A revolution had just happened in Turkey, and Austria-Hungary acted quickly to take over this new land before Turkish power could be restored. Russia they complained about it, about Austria-Hungary taking this land, but they couldn't do anything. And then the country of Serbia, uh, they wanted to get Austria-Hungary out of Bosnia because they were trying to create this larger country where people of Slavic ancestry could all join together. That country would be called Yugoslavia or the Union of Southern Slavs. Now, Austria-Hungary, they feared this revolutionary movement that Serbia was doing. They had no intentions of allowing Yugoslavia to be formed. So there's a lot of trouble happening in the Balkan region, which is today like Serbia, Bosnia, Montenegro, Greece, Romania, Bulgaria, that part of Europe. Well... In June of 1914, the heir to the Austrian throne, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, and his wife, Sofia, are going to go to Sarajevo, which was the capital of Bosnia. While Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife are in Bosnia, bad things are going to happen. Now, this is just a map here that kind of gives you an idea of where we're talking about. The black outline, which is the mouse is slowly going around, all of that was the Austro-Hungarian Empire. This area right here, Bosnia, is the new part of the empire, and the city in question is going to be Sarajevo, right there. The mouse going around it. Well, as I said, Franz Ferdinand and his wife are going to go to Bosnia. While in Sarajevo, a Serbian terrorist group known as the Black Hand are going to assassinate the Archduke. And by the way, they're not very good at this assassination. They try not once, not twice, but three different times to kill this guy. And they kill him almost by accident. But Austria-Hungary, they're pretty angry, of course. And they're going to use the murder of Franz Ferdinand 
as an excuse to crush Serbia and its anti-Austrian sentiment, its anti-Austrian movement all for once. So Austria is going to put together a list of 21 demands and Serbia will agree to 19 of the 21. Um, one of the two agreements that Serbia doesn't ex uh, doesn't agree to was to have the Austrian army come in patrol and keep the peace inside the country of Serbia while the investigation into this murder is going on. Now you can kind of see why Serbia would say no to that. Even though Serbia agreed to 19 of the 21 demands and agreed to negotiate on the remaining two, Austria claimed it was not satisfied and began to bomb the city of Belgrade, which was the capital of Serbia. It is at that point that Serbia calls on Russia for help. And Russia is going to respond because Russia saw itself as the big brother to the Serbian people. Now, Russia had intended only to mobilize and move part of its army directly bordering that the country of Austria-Hungary. But every single one of Russia's battle plans had assumed a war with Germany. And because of the way its battle plans were written, it couldn't just mobilize one part of the army, but it had to mobilize the entire thing, including the part that was next to Germany. Now, Germany and Austria had negotiations before this war started. Austria asked for Germany's unconditional support if war broke out, and Germany gave Austria what's known today as the blank check. Basically, Germany agreed to assist Austria no matter what. So this war is going to begin on accident. Once Germany realizes what is happening and once Germany realizes that Russia is ready to go to war, Germany is going to attempt to back out of its alliance with Austria. Unfortunately though, Austria is going to require, declare, uh, whatever word you want to choose, they're going to force Germany to hold up their end of the agreement. They're going to force Germany to cash the so-called blank check once Austria puts in all the zeros it wants. So Germany, they are going to go to war and they're going to use what's known as the von Schlieffen plan. Now the von Schlieffen plan was the secret plan that was created by a German military general. And the plan involved attacking France by going through this country of Belgium, but keeping so close to the sea that the British can't land any help on the coast. And the Germans wanted, wanted to defeat France in about six weeks. Once France was beaten in that six week period, the plan was then to take the entire German army, turn it around, use the railroads that were in Germany and get their army over to Russia before Russia was ready. Because Russia was old, Russia was slow, and it would take weeks for Russia to get to the battlefield. And rather than fight, it was thought that Russia would then surrender if Russia had to force or had to fight the entire German army. Uh, this is what Germany looked like in the First World War. You got Germany, which was much bigger than it is today. You got the Austria-Hungarian Empire. And then you've got surrounded by Britain, France, there's Belgium, there's Serbia down there at the bottom, and then there's Russia. This right here was the von Schlieffen plan, by the way. Those red lines with the arrows, that is where the German army was supposed to go. 
and the idea was to surround and defeat the city of Paris within just a couple of weeks. And then once that's done, they would be able to could go back through Germany and take on the Russian army. Now, what about the troop strength? When we get to World War I, um, at the main the main issue of World War One, it's not economics, it's not war guilt, it's not the breaking of treaties. It was Germany and Austria-Hungary trying to upset the balance of power. And there are some historians who really don't understand why this war happened because the two sides were very, very... Um, even. The Triple Entente had about 30 million troops. The Triple Alliance had about 25 million troops. The biggest benefit that the Triple Entente had was British economics. Of the 30 million troops that the Triple Entente had, about 12 million of them were Russian and the Russians were very poorly led. They were abysmally equipped. They were sent to battle without guns. So even though the Triple Entente had 30 million, uh, that's not necessarily saying 30 million troops were good. The British Navy, as I was starting to say a moment ago, really is what won the war for the, uh, the Triple Entente. Because the British Navy was able to keep the German Navy locked up in both the North Sea and the Baltic Sea. And that meant that for the most part, the British Navy was open to the rest of the world. It could resupply itself. It could get raw materials from its colonies. Germany could not because it was pretty much trapped. Britain was going to be able to prolong the war and grind it out and win just because of resilience. Now that doesn't mean the German Navy isn't going to try to get involved. The German Navy is going to build U-boats or Unterzee boats, literally undersea boats. And these German submarines or U-boats are going to try and stop the British Navy and try to stop British imports. The German Navy cannot keep up with all of the British ships. The German U-boats cannot possibly sink enough supply ships to win the war. And Germany, by the time we get to late 1917, early 19, it's going to be faced with rebellions due to starvation and economic collapse. Much of the land fighting is in trench warfare. These trench fights are for just feet per day. The, the trenches don't move very much. I think the largest tr troop movement in World War One might have been 20 miles in one day. It's a, it's a stalemate when you look at Western Europe um, thousands and thousands and thousands of people dying per day. But in the east, where Russia is, there's still a lot of movement in the Eastern War, still a lot of uses of horses and things like that. It's almost like two different fights are happening at one time, which is part of what makes World War I so hard to study is because there's so much going on. There were so many trenches in the West that you could walk from the beaches of France all the way to the mountains of Switzerland without ever coming above ground. Both the French and the Germans, or the British and the Germans, they both sides built these elaborate trenches. These trenches have communications, 
they have beds, they have places to eat, they have places for medicine. They're very, very elaborate. The land between the two sides was known as no man's land, and it had barbed wire, it had mines, it had craters in it, dead bodies, you name it. And each day and began and ended with what was known as Stand 2. Uh, if you were going to attack, you most often did it when the sun was behind your back because then it upset the enemy. They couldn't see you coming. So both sides, they were preparing either to defend an attack or to go on attack at sunrise and sunset because that was when it was thought you had the best possible chance of winning. And then overnight, any repairs needed to the trenches, that's when those would be done. Now all of this fighting has a huge impact on European culture and I've read several books on this that just kind of make you understand how much things changed. The number of people dying, the, the amount of losses was just unfathomable. Uh, for example, in 1916 near the Battle of the Somme, Britain and France together gained a total of 125 square miles, but they lost 600,000 dead in like three days of battle. In Verdun, the Germans they advanced 20 square miles and they lost half a million, 500,000 men. So the, just the sheer scale of death is not comprehensible to the European people. Both sides have propaganda to convince people to fight and to support the war. One very famous American propaganda poster shows this large, tall gorilla carrying a woman who's supposed to be Lady Liberty and crushing bones, a giant stick ready to beat down America. And the idea was to scare the Americans into realizing or, or feeling like their liberty was in danger. And this idea of the propaganda it is found on both sides. In France and Britain, German music is made illegal. Rubella is renamed into the German measles. And even classical German music such as Mozart, Brahms, Beethoven, that is banned from being played on the radio. The United States will eventually get involved in this war. Uh, the United States was officially neutral, but almost from the beginning, public opinion, both inside and outside government, are going to be torn on this. Now, the United States will lend money and equipment to the allied countries, but those were just considered loans and it was considered still a benefit to the United States. Some of the equipment that's lended are old ships, guns, ammunition, just generalized supplies, and the majority of it is sent to Britain and France. Now, why does the United States get involved? There are really three primary reasons. Number one is unrestricted submarine warfare. The Germans started to sink all ships, saying that every ship going to and from Europe was a legitimate target. Specifically, one ship called the Lusitania was uh, viewed in America as a 100% passenger ship even though the furthest forward cargo hold of Lusitania was full of weapons. There's also the Zimmerman telegram where a 
representative of the German government sends to the Mexican government a note promising the Mexican government help in securing victory against the German, or I'm sorry, against the American government, the American armed forces. Now, what is crazy is that the Mexican government actually considered whether attacking the United States would be a good idea or not. Now, when the United States declares war on Germany on April 4th, 1917, it doesn't send a lot of troops there at once. The number of American soldiers going into Germany and into Europe is very small at first, but it does eventually ramp up and, and continue to grow and grow and grow. All total, the United States sends about 2 million soldiers to France with another, I think it's half a million people still receiving their training in the United States. Now, Russia, over in the east, in 1914 and 1915, it is able to fight Germany on fairly even grounds, and it holds its own against Austria-Hungary as well. But by 1916, the Russian army begins to lose steam because they run out of weapons, they run out of ammunition, and they cannot resupply the military. By the time we get into 1916, 1917, the number of, of Russians who are losing their lives is just astronomical. Both 1916 and 1917 saw Russia lose over a million people to just death. The fighting between Russia and Germany gets so bad that in early 1918, Russia is forced to accept a completely and totally humiliating peace agreement with Germany, known as the Brest-Litovsk Treaty. And according to the treaty, the Russians surrendered like 1 million square miles of land. And of that 1 million square miles of land was one third of the Russian total of land that could be farmed, one third of Russia's factories, and three fourths of Russia's coal and iron deposits. So after the war, Russia will lose a lot of military to German advances. Now, Germany will surrender. Uh, as the war grinds to a halt in 1918, uh, the German general staff of the army begins to realize, you know what, we've lost this war. Uh, Germany has never invaded British, French, Russian, you name it. No enemy soldiers reach it to German territory. But Germany realizes that they are just living on borrowed time and the the German people, they're not told this, and when the German government surrenders their army, the German people cannot believe it because in the eyes of the German person, their army, their military, their country was winning. Now, the U.S. President Woodrow Wilson is going to go on record and say the Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm, must abdicate his throne as part of any peace treaty. Kaiser Wilhelm will surrender his army. German citizens are completely shocked and confused. And if you want to know when the war ended, the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. In other words, November 11th, 1914, which is today Veterans Day, and you don't have school or anything like that on Veterans Day. Now, another big part of what's going on here in 1917, 1918, 1919, uh, at the same time that the World War is happening, is the Russian Revolution. The Russian Revolution is a sideshow that's happening at the same time as World War I is. 
Now, the Russian Revolution, it's not just one revolution. It's actually a series of revolutions that happen in 1917. And there are some long-term causes. There are some short-term causes. Uh, the underlying long-term causes, um, it's a lack of reform. Russia had not changed at all during the late 1800s or early 1900s. Russian czars still suppressed any liberal idea. Russian czars still repressed any liberal movement. About the only liberal thing that the Russian government had done was free the serfs. But other than that, the Russian government is extremely conservative. The leaders of Tsarist Russia were um, absolute monarchs. That's the best way to put it. So the Russian government, the Russian Tsar, in many ways is out of touch with the Russian people. And the immediate cause, the reason that the revolution is actually going to happen, it, it's World War I. Russia loses 10% of its population. I mean, in 1915 alone, Russia suffered 2 million casualties. The Russian army was sending soldiers to the front lines, poorly equipped. Um, many soldiers are sent to the front without any weapons, and they're actually told, hey, when your comrade next to you falls, pick up their gun and continue fighting. Russian soldiers are poorly led. Russian soldiers don't have very good leadership, and they're not equipped. They don't have the guns. They don't have anything they need to succeed. Strangely enough, there are also some family issues going on with the Russian Tsar. Uh, for example, Tsar Nicholas II is trying to lead the military himself, personally. His wife is slowly going crazy. Their son, Alexa, is suffering from hemophilia. And then there's this random guy named Gregory Rasputin who says, hey, I can cure your son of his can his uh, his cancer and his hemophilia and anything else that's wrong with him. He says he can cure Prince Alexei. And Rasputin is going to work his way into the family and Rasputin is going to end up becoming the primary advisor to Nicholas and Alexandra and Rasputin is going to um, not have a very good reputation with the people of Russia. Rasputin is going to be murdered in 1916 and in March of 1917, the Tsar is going to abdicate his throne and this moderate government is going to come to power. Um, the first of the leaders of the revolutionary period is going to be Prince Lvov. And Prince Lvov is not in any way related to Nicholas. He's just, that's his name as Prince. Now, this provisional government wanted to continue fighting in World War I. Um, there was a, a suspicion that the German position was weakening, and there was this feeling that the Allies were going to win. So the provisional government continued to keep fighting because they wanted to be on the victorious side. Now, overall, uh, this March Revolution, it's very moderate. It's headed by the middle class. They wanted self-government. They wanted equal laws, universal suffrage, freedom of religion, these very egalitarian ideas where everybody's equal. But these are positions that were only enjoyed by a select few within Russia. 
The second leader of this revolutionary period is Alexander Kerensky. He's going to become the prime minister of the provisional government in Maine of 1917. And Kerensky is a little bit more progressive than Prince Lvov. But he makes two very important mistakes. One mistake is he refused to confiscate the large estates of the Russian nobility and give the peasants the land. He thought that would destroy the army if he did that. He thought that if we gave land to the peasants that they would leave the fight and they would go home and claim their acres. Kerensky tried to continue the war just as those before him had done. And he didn't stop to think that Russia was not united. Kerensky was thinking that if we kept Russia in the war that all of Russia would come together, nationalism, blah, blah, blah. But in reality, Russia was made up of several dozen different countries that didn't necessarily agree with what Russia did. Overall, Kerensky just had no idea how angry the Russian people were, and the Russian people were ready to turn against Kerensky. They were just waiting for the right moment. And that's where the Bolshevik Party comes in. Now, the Bolsheviks are a political party led by Vladimir Lenin and Leon Trotsky. Uh, Vladimir Lenin had actually been exiled and removed from from Russia and during World War One, most of the time he lived in Switzerland. Now the uh, Bolsheviks, they are a follower of Karl Marx. The Bolsheviks are a, um, a communist group and they believe that the middle class, the bourgeoisie, were so weak that the working class, the proletariat, could cause a social revolution and overthrow the middle managers and take over the middle class. Now Lenin, as part of this idea that Russia was ready for a workers-led reunion, openly called for the provisional government to be ignored and weakened and everything else. And at one point, a a secondary government is formed before the election ends or before the the revolution ends and you end up with multiple governments within Russia working at the same time just for very very different goals. Kerensky for his part he at first does try to work with Lenin, Trotsky and the Bolsheviks but he realizes very quickly that Lenin has he doesn't really care what Kerensky's doing, and Lenin wants power for himself. So, November 9th, Lenin and the Bolsheviks are going to overthrow the provisional government in the city of Petrograd. And these demonstrations are going to be started all over the country as news spreads of Lenin overthrowing the provisional government. Now, once the revolution starts, the Bolsheviks, they have to fight to survive because everybody knows that they, they seized power illegally through revolutions. And for several years, there is some very effective opposition against them. Lenin, who is going to claim control of the Russian government, will be the one who negotiates the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk and it is Lenin who's responsible for giving one-third of Russia's people, 80% of its iron, 90% of its carrot, uh, coal, I should say, and um, um, a good deal of its farmland, too. All I could think of was carrots, and there's more than carrots, of course. Now, another item a lot of people don't know about this Russian Revolution is that there was a full-blown civil war in Russia. 
you have the white Russians who supported the Tsar or just were um, pro-monarchy. The red Russians are pro-Lenin, pro-Bolsheviks, pro-communism. And a, an army made up of the United States, Japan, Britain, and France joined together, invade Albany from the, uh, or not Albany, they, they invade Russia from the, the West. Not, ah. They invade Russia from the east and they try to move west. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, the idea was to force Russia back into the war, even though Russia had already signed a peace treaty, that treaty of Brest-Litovsk with, uh, with Germany. And as multinational army fights all the way up until 1919, the multinational army will withdraw from Russia in 1919, but the white Russians continue to fight. And it's really 1920 going into 1921 that the white Russians win, or that the white Russians lose, and the red Russians are able to truly set up a communist government. So Lenin is going to start to create this communist state. Uh, he uses the blueprint that Karl Marx put in the Communist Manifesto. A uh, big problem, though, is if you read the Communist Manifesto, he tells you what's going to happen before the revolution. He tells you what's going to happen during the revolution, but he doesn't tell you what to do after the revolution. And because Lenin was doing exactly what Marx said to do, um, Lenin didn't really know what the next step was. So Lenin, he... Um, he really did strict communism at first. He privatized, he took all the private property and he made it public, he made it part of the state. He set maximum incomes. He collectivized everything so everybody worked for the government. And what happened is the Russian industrial output and the Russian agricultural output just bombed. Russia was producing like barely anything. It was one-sixth of its pre-World War I limits even. I mean, Lenin proved that true communism did not work. Lenin also didn't really trust the lower class, even though this is supposed to be a revolution of the lower class. He did not trust the lower class or the working class at all. He thought peasants were backwards. He thought that the lower classes were weak. And he, uh, Lenin wanted to maintain a strong grip on the government. Lenin is going to realize that uh, true communism doesn't work. And he's going to ease up on that. And there will be some capitalism let back into Russia. For example, uh, there you had a quota you had to produce from the state. But anything above and beyond whatever that quota was, was yours to sell and make a small, tiny profit off of. This becomes known as the New Economic Policy. And by 1924, the New Economic Policy is going to save Russia. And something like 30 or 40 percent of all businesses in Russia will be owned by private citizens uh, by the year 1930. There's a lot of trouble going on, a lot of things happening in Russia, too, um, all during this Revolutionary War period and this World War I period. Now, the big question now, after we've solved World War I and we've had the Russian Revolution, is what happens in between the two wars? This is going to be what happens in the 20s, what happens in the 30s. The first thing you really need to know about is the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, Versailles, if you didn't know, that was the traditional home of the French kings. And after the French Revolution, it became the, the Louvre Museum. But in 1918, 1919, it's going to be the site of the peace negotiations that end World War I. Now, Woodrow Wilson, the American president, 
he is going to introduce what's known as the 14 points. These were going to be the 14 different points that the World War I would end on. And the Treaty of Versailles, in theory, was supposed to be based on the 14 points of Woodrow Wilson, but in reality, it's not going to have anything to do with them. Now, the 14 points, they are important because Germany surrenders, thinking that the 14 points would be abided by, and that's how the piece would be written. Uh, don't worry if you've never had U.S. History 2 and you don't know what the the um, 14 points are. The important parts, what I think is important, um, no secret negotiations, everything has to be talked about in the open. Everybody has a right to determine their own future. It's called self-determination. All the countries of Europe that were once part of another country would be able to have a vote to decide what happens to them. All countries have to trade equally. All militaries have to shrink. And then all international ships be allowed to go wherever they want to go. The three important people that are at Versailles are David Lloyd George, who's at the top. He is the British Prime Minister. He was actually a middle-of-the-road guy. He was a moderate, but when he ran for election, he ran on the platform of Hang the Kaiser, which meant that even if he wanted to be nice when the Germans surrender, he couldn't. Uh, his main goal was to destroy German economic power and take German colonies. Uh, for France, Georges Clemenceau, he wanted revenge. He was a veteran of the Franco-Prussian War of the 1870s. Uh, he wanted Germany forever made weak, and he wanted the United States to guarantee the safety of France. And then last but not least, Woodrow Wilson there at the bottom right. He is like the perfect blueprint for a president. He... Uh, was well-educated. He had served in local politics. He had been uh, an administrator at various colleges. He was very, very book smart. Um, but he was also idealistic. He didn't like to compromise. He basically said, it's my way or not. And he didn't compromise very often. And he was very, very idyllic. Uh, he had this certain ideal, this certain, certain idea that the world had to... Um, work around and without that then the world just wasn't going to have you now because Woodrow Wilson knew that David Lloyd George and Clemenceau weren't going to listen to him he was going to bypass both of them and just go to the European people and put pressure on the European people saying hey the, this is my idea for peace and if you want peace, you should like my idea and you should pressure your local politicians to sign on to my 14 points. And he thought that's how the peace treaty would work. But as I said a slide before, this ends up being all about revenge. Pardon the pause in the video. If you noticed one, it's time to blow my nose. There are um, allergies everywhere. Wow. Um, anyways, negotiations. David Lloyd George, George Clemenceau, they had no plans on doing anything that Woodrow Wilson accepted. Both sides said there's no way we're doing open negotiations because that could be used by our enemies, both foreign and domestic. Woodrow Wilson left the idea of freedom of the sea so generic, nobody knew what he meant. And then the idea of actually Letting people choose their own adventure meant that the old countries might lose territory to new countries. Um, traditional borders would be would be redrawn, and um, that was a non-starter. The only thing that people agreed to was a League of Nations because that's a place where all the countries of the world would be able to get together and talk about their ideas and talk about their problems. And the United Nations today is very much along the same lines of the League of Nations. But the League of Nations, it did not stop war. 
And there are questions today in 2022 whether the um, United Nations could stop a war. A, a quote I like, um, I think it was George Clemenceau. He said, God gave us the Ten Commandments and we broke them. Wilson gives us the 14 points. We shall see. Now, the idea behind the League of Nations, um, all League members would agree to preserve the national integrity of a country. And if one country invaded another, that meant that the invading country was, in theory, invading everybody, and everybody would come to that one country's aid. Now, the question is, did that same collective security agreement count for brand new countries that were created? Was it only for old countries, uh, countries that couldn't defend themselves? Did you have to come in and do the defense for them? And the United States, they just say, nope, we don't want to get involved in this at all. And the United States is not going to ratify, accept, or operate with the United Nations. Now, what were the treaty terms? The, the um, Treaty Versailles, very, very long document, but I'm gonna just limit it to these six things for you. These are the only six things I really want you to know from the treaty. Number one, Germany loses over 10% of its population and over 10% of its territory. A 50 mile wide part of West Germany, uh, it's demilitarized, meaning that Technically, it's part of Germany, but Germany cannot control it. A piece of German land in the east is given to a brand new country called Poland. So that way the Polish government and the Polish businesses had access to the, the Baltic Sea. The city of Danzig is taken away from Germany. The city of Danzig is named an international city and it's in, in reality becomes a Polish city and it's renamed to Gdansk, which it's called today. All the German colonies are taken away. Germany's ordered to pay the entire cost of the war, even though they didn't start it. And um, I made this PowerPoint before inflation, uh, $565 billion, add about 8% to that, and that's what today's military value would be. Oh, and by the way, the German army is limited to 100,000 soldiers which means millions of German soldiers are fired or laid off, and Germany only keeps the best 100,000. There's a post-war economic collapse here in the United States. We know it as the Great Depression, but the Great Depression it actually hits Europe almost as soon as the war is over. Um, the United States, you got the Roaring Twenties, and in Europe, the Roaring Twenties never happens. Huge amount of war debt that has to be paid. Germany's currency completely collapsed to the point that German Reichmarks or German money, it's, it's worth more as fire would and being burned than it is being spent. 20 million plus deaths, 21 million plus wounded. And then when Germany actually tries to pay back its war debt, it destroys its own economy and that in turn destroys everybody else's economy too. Um, in November of 1923, it took 800 million German Reichmarks to equal $1. When in 1914, I think it was a four to one ratio. Basically the German Reichmark was a quarter. The United States, it benefits from the war because the United States has never attacked. Um, production soars, profit soars, um, everybody parties, people start playing in the stock market. Uh, over 9 million people join the original Wall Street bets. Um, people start to speculate in the stock market and back then the stock market was a little different. Um, Today you have to pay full price for your stock, but back then you only had to put about 10% down. So where did the other 90% of the value come from? Well, it was believed in the 1920s, stocks only went up. Nobody expected them to go down. By the time we get to 1929, a lot of people are gambling money they don't actually have, and construction projects start to slow down, auto sales start to slow down, 
and banks start to get worried that something is going to happen that maybe people will stop buying things and stop spending money. On October 24th, 1929, that's known as Black Thursday. On October 24th, 1929, the stock market falls more than 10%. The stock market closes and reopens the next Monday and it continues to fall. And it falls and falls and falls for almost non-stop in the next three years. The Civil War started in the 70s, 80s, and Well, not, not 780s, but 380s. And by the time the stock market fall ends, it's down into double digits, 41. Um, it's a much smaller stock market than today, but the percentage that it fell, I mean, over 10% of your wealth is lost basically overnight. People just, they lose everything. So you're going to get the Great Depression. Now, this is something that I cover a lot more in American history. Um, the Great Depression, if I were to give you three causes, it's an unfair distribution of wealth. Wealth was very much situated at the top of the American food chain. There's a lot of overproduction. There are a lot of new products coming to market. But at the time, people, they only needed so many washing machines. They only needed so many refrigerators. They only need so many cars. And once the market was saturated, businesses continued to produce like there was no tomorrow. And then Europe. Europe was broke. Europe was broken. And nobody in Europe was able to buy anything. So Europe was just ruined. Between 1929 and 1932, the value of the United States drops by almost 50%. Over 5,000 banks fail, and when your bank failed, you lost everything. Unemployment was of over 25%. That's overall. If you were a minority, unemployment for you is closer to 90%. If you were a farmer... Oh, one second here. All right, I apologize for that interruption. I had a phone call I couldn't miss. Um, where was I? Oh, yeah. Um, the Great Depression. Herbert Hoover was the president of the United States during the Great Depression. And Herbert Hoover, he's an enigma. He, he meant well as a president, but he executed very poorly. Um, when businesses started to lose all their money, he begged and pleaded for the businesses to keep their employees on, to keep paying wages, to keep making uh, goods so that people could earn money. Um, and businesses agreed to do that for a little while, but you can only lose money for so long and so businesses started to shut down. When the businesses started to shut down, Herbert Hoover then went to state and, and uh, local governments and asked them to help the unemployed and help the poor. But there were just so many unemployed people and so many poor people that the local governments and the state governments were overwhelmed. And through it all, Herbert Hoover tried to raise taxes so that he could balance the budget and make sure that the United States didn't go broke, even though there was no money to pay any tax increases. So this is a really, really interesting time in American history where a lot of things go wrong and there's not really anything that could have been done to stop it. Now, all of this is going to bring us finally to World War II. And to talk about World War II, uh, this kind of goes with that 
in between the war, this is your segue between one topic and the other, is the idea of fascism. Um, fascism is, it's almost undefinable. I can tell you right now that nothing, the fascism does not exist in today's world in the, in the traditional sense. Um, pockets of fascism may be viewable in certain places of the world, but fascism as it was in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s does not exist. Um, fascism works within the existing government. Fascism works within the confines of the rules. Fascism works with the government, with the businesses, with the army, and it always came to power legally. Fascism is really created by this guy who's staring into your soul right now named Benito Mussolini. Uh, he is going to work his way up to um, control Italy. And if you're wondering why fascism comes to power in Italy, it's because Italy was promised certain things during World War I that it did not get. Primarily, power, land, and money. After Italy is left out of the negotiations to end World War I, even though it was promised a piece of the pie, the Italian economy collapses and a revolution happens in 1922 because of how bad Italy has gotten. The king of Italy will, in 1922, allow Mussolini to become basically the prime minister. And as prime minister, Mussolini is going to rig the 1924 election and give his party a massive victory in the election. And Mussolini is going to promise the Italian people anything and everything they want. And a very famous Mussolini quote is, nothing above the state, nothing outside the state, nothing against the state. A protege of Mussolini is Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler is going to take this idea of fascism and tweak it a little bit and give it a racial tinge, a racial overtone. Nazism is, is hard to define as fascism because Nazism is a form of fascism. Not, the Nazis came to power legally. They worked within the existing government. Uh, the biggest difference is the Nazis thought they were racially superior. They hated Jews because they thought the Jewish people were what caused the loss of World War I. They're anti-communist. They're anti-capitalist. They're on a whole nother level by themselves. Now, why Germany? Um, Germany had a really bad economic downturn in the 1920s. And then on top of that, there was a very interesting and unique part of the Weimar Constitution known as Article 48. And in Article 48, paraphrasing of course, if the safety and security of Germany were threatened, then the government could rule through emergency. Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party will manufacture an emergency, blame it on the communists, and then they will legally take over the government. Now, Adolf Hitler, um, he's an interesting character, that's all I can say. Uh, 1923, he tried to overthrow the government of Germany. He got thrown in jail. While he was in jail, he wrote the book Mein Kampf, or My Struggle. And in Mein Kampf, he basically gives you his entire outlook on life, uh, the universe, what he's going to do if he gets out of jail, and, and what his goal is for the government. He's going to become the leader of the Nazis, or the Nationalist Socialist German Workers' Party. And if you wonder why they're called the Nazis, it's because in German it's the National Socialistisch uh, Deutscher Arbeitspartei. First word is Nazi and all, Nazi. The Nazi party, their goal is to end the Treaty of Versailles, unify Germany and Austria, kick the Jewish people out, and take over the government. The German people under the age of 30 
were the primary supporters of the Nazi party. Uh, like 40% of the Nazi party supporters were 30 years of age or younger. By 1932, the Nazis are the largest political party in Germany. They're not the majority. Uh, they never are the majority, but they are the largest. 1929, there's a huge economic collapse, just like the United States has the Great Depression. Germany has a Great Depression. 45% unemployment, 6 million unemployed Jews. The Nazi party starts to promise that they can fix everything. And Hitler is going to be named the chancellor in 1933 when the president of Germany asks him to fix the problems. As I mentioned, the Nazi party, they manufacture a, a crisis. The Reichstag building, their, their version of their capital. The Reichstag is set on fire in March 1933. It's actually set on fire by the Nazis, but the Nazis say that the communists did it. And so the German government uses Article 48 to give Hitler emergency powers. And then from 1933 all the way until the end, 1945, Hitler is going to rule Germany using these national emergency powers. Hitler's policies can be broken down really into two parts, fix the economy and ethnic cleansing. To fix the German economy, Hitler is going to completely ignore what the Treaty of Versailles says. He's going to build up the German army, he's going to build German weapons, he's going to rebuild the German public works, he's going to build German highways, and with all of this construction, all of this building, unemployment drops from 6 million in 1933 to basically zero in 1937. 74% of all German government expenditures are military expenditures. The German economy is going to become a giant war machine. As far as ethnic cleansing goes, that starts in 1935 with the Nuremberg Laws, where German Jews are take their citizenship is taken away. Also, certain citizen or er, certain professions are taken away, like Jews can no longer be scientists, bankers, they can't be lawyers, they can't be teachers. So that's all in 1935. In 1938, Kristallnacht, or the Night of Broken Glass, is going to see Jews begin to be rounded up for the first time when Jewish stores are broken into and destroyed, synagogues are destroyed, and Jews start to have to wear the Yellow Star of David. The first Jews are deported out of Germany in 1941. But a lot of the Jewish people have already seen what's going to happen, and millions of Jewish people have already left the country. Germany officially renounces the Treaty of Versailles in March of 1935. The Spanish Civil War happens in 1936, which gives Germany the chance to test out all of its new weapons. Germany and Austria joined together in March of 1938, and then in September of 1938, pieces of Czechoslovakia are given to Germany. So this is a map of Europe in the late 1930s. You can see Germany is this peach or orangish color. You can see it's broken into East and West Germany here. Poland is a new country, and there's the Polish corridor that was taken from Germany. Germany is going to gain control of the Sudetenland. Austria is going to reoccupy the Rhineland. It's going to get half of Czechoslovakia all before World War II starts. So World War II will actually begin um, the causes of World War II, if you really want to know, they're the same as World War I. Uh, there's nationalism. Uh, the winners are very prideful. 
the losers, they hate losing and they want to avenge the lost. Uh, militarism. The winners of World War I wanted to maintain superiority. The losers wanted revenge. Imperialism. Everybody still needs resources. Everybody still needs their colonies. And then alliances. Even though you thought they would learn from World War I, alliances are, have problems. The alliances persisted through the 1920s and 1930s. They just changed a little bit. But the immediate cause, like the reason World War II starts, September 1st, 1939, Germany invades Poland. Germany makes a secret deal September 1st, 1939. It's decided that Germany and the Soviet Union, formerly known as Russia, will divide Poland in half. Germany launches an invasion and Germany and the Soviet Union, they are able to take over Poland in less than a month. It's about three weeks. When that happens, the United States is going to revise its neutrality acts to allow the United States to sell weapons to other countries. By the end of summer 1940, the German army has taken over Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Belgium, Norway, Denmark, France, and I think that's everybody. The only real country left standing in Europe against the Nazis or the fascists is Great Britain. In June of 1941, Hitler and the German high command are going to decide to invade the Soviet Union and that is Operation Barbarossa and that is really Hitler's downfall because the, the Lend-Lease program where the United States was lending Great Britain weapons in exchange for payment later that's going to be extended to the Soviet Union and that is the first step of the United States coming into the war, and that is the first step of the Soviet Union turning the tide against Germany. By 1943, the German advance into the Soviet Union has stopped. The city of Stalingrad holds against the German army. Uh, the German army gets to the suburbs of Moscow, and once the German army is stopped in central or I should say central west Russia it's just going to go at the beginning of the end the German army begins to be pushed further and further and further back the British and the United States will invade North Africa and then they'll eventually invade Italy that's known as Operation Torch Japan by the way they are involved in this too the Japanese and the Chinese had been uh, fighting each other since 1937. And the fighting between Japan and China was just further and further and further escalating to the point that the United States began to put economic sanctions on the Japanese government. Every time that Japan did something, the United States would put more economic pressure on. And then eventually Japan and the United States completely cut trade off from each other. Um, the Japanese threaten the United States with an attack. Nobody from the United States thinks it's possible because of the distance between the two. But as we all know, Pearl Harbor happens December 7th, 1941, a date that will live in infamy. In the two waves of attacks that the Japanese uh, launch on the United States. Uh, you get almost 2,500 dead, another 1,200 wounded, uh, 20 plus ships bombed, including almost every battleship in the fleet. Um, and within six months of that date, within six months of December 7th, 1941, the, the war is going to turn against Japan in the Pacific Ocean. 
Here in the United States, there are four different government agencies that are established. There's the War Production Board, the National War La Labor Board, the Office of Price Administration, and the Office of War Mobilization. Now, if you want to know what these four do, the War Production Board, that decides who will get what government contracts and what the companies are going to produce. For example, Ford quit building cars and they started to build airplanes. The National War Labor Board was supposed to settle any disputes and make sure that people got paid. The Office of Price Administration, they set minimum and maximum prices so that there was no price gouging. And then there's the Office of War Mobilization that organized the entire war and made sure that the war effort was successful. Uh, whenever I teach American history, I like to say the Office of War Mobilization is really the brains of the entire operation. By the end of 1942, beginning of 1943, a full third of the American economy is devoted to war production. So America becomes a big um, war machine too. And it's actually the entrance of America into the war that ends the Great Depression. There are some changes in American society. Uh, Americans start to migrate both uh, s towards the north and to the west because that's where the centers of production were. More than six million women are gonna enter the workforce. Marriage rates go sky high birth rates go sky high and divorce rates go sky high because of the war as well. And the United States becomes a uh, country of childhood delinquents because so many people are either working or at war. There's really nobody left to take care of the kids. The beginnings of the um, the racial justice movement and the civil rights movement can be treated can be uh, found in World War II when African American workers demand equal rights and equal pay. Japanese Americans are rounded up and over 100,000 of them are sent to uh, concentration camps out west. And um, soldiers of Japanese descent try to prove their worth by um, becoming the most decorated regiment in American history, winning something like 20,000 medals. It's an insane number of, of uh, recommend, rec, uh, recognitions is the word I'm trying to think of. So how does World War II end? Well, the, I know this probably is um, surprising to hear, but Russia could have won the European war all by itself. The Russian forces begin to force the German army to retreat. There's no turning back from that. Uh, D-Day on June 6, 1944 is going to speed up the defeat of the German government and the German army. Germany will surrender on May 8, 1945. In Japan, on the other hand, that is primarily a United States fight. And with the Battle of Midway in 1942, the Japanese advance stops. And by the time we get to August of 1945, the American government has invented the atomic bomb and they drop not one but two of them onto the Japanese people. The Japanese are going to surrender on September 2nd, 1945, uh, not because they wanted to, but literally because the emperor demanded it. Three diplomatic meetings to know about World War II. Um, these are the three big meetings between uh, the United States, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union. You've got the meeting at Tehran, which is in this, the country of Iran. Uh, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin, they meet to discuss what Europe's gonna look like after the war's over, and they, they cannot agree on what's gonna happen in Eastern Europe. Yalta, which is in southern Russia, that's February 1945. That's where it's decided that Germany will be split into different parts and the United Nations will be created. And then Potsdam, April 1945, this is a suburb of Berlin in Germany. Um, Winston Churchill is going to lose an election in the middle of this meeting and while the meeting's happening, he's going to be replaced by a new guy named Clement Attlee. Franklin D. Roosevelt 
has just passed away and Vice President Harry Truman is now going to be the president. And then Joseph Stalin is not really going to like Clement Attlee or Truman. And he's going to let his, his um, Prime Minister uh, Molotov do most of the talking. And at Potsdam, it's decided that Japan will have to surrender unconditionally. And the Soviet Union will enter the war against Japan, but they wait until the absolute last minute. And in many ways, the, tr the uh, meeting at Potsdam is the beginning of the Cold War. Wow, so this is going to be like an hour and a half long video. I'm so sorry to do this to you, but as you can tell, this is a big topic and with only one week to cover it, um, I had to go a little long. So thank you for listening. Thank you for putting up with this. If there's anything in this video that doesn't make sense, please feel free to email and ask. Um, World War One, World War Two, they are uh, two topics that I'm very interested in. So there's a lot more information I could put in here, but I of course you know had to limit it to your um, your attention spans. So thank you for making it through this, and um, we'll talk to you soon. Don't forget to be working on your museum review. Don't forget to be working on your SLO. Any questions on those, please email me as well. All right, that's it. We'll see you later.